And the moment I open my mouth with my semi-Swedish dialect and say, hey, I'm Oscar, I'm from Sweden, and we do music, everyone without exception goes, that makes sense. This is interesting. What do you have to say? <laughs> All right, welcome to Heia Framtiden, the Swedish podcast about the future. Um, I'm sitting here at Södermalm in Stockholm. My name is Christian von Essen, and I'm uh, here with Oscar Höglund, uh, co-founder and, and CEO at Epidemic Sound. Welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Um, let's begin by describing what Epidemic is and um, how you got started in the first place. What was the, the problem that you saw in the market? So I think that there are two different ways of explaining what we're trying to do. Um, there's the problematic approach, and then there's the visionary approach. Um, so let's start with the visionary one. I'm a proud father of three. My kids are now 12, 11, and 8. And many, many years ago, together with my co-founders, we had the same kind of idea or vision of the future. And so I saw myself having a discussion with not my kids, but with my grandkids. And uh, I was old, I don't know, 80, 90, 150, depending on if CRISPR works or not. Um, and my grandkids are looking up at me and they go, Grandad, Grandad, your generation, you basically invented the internet, right? And I look at my grandkids and I'm all proud and I tear up and I'm like, yes, yes, that, that, was, that was our generation. And they go, that was amazing. I think that's probably your generation's biggest contribution to future generations. How does it feel? And I go, well, it feels amazing. I'm, I'm very, very proud. And they go, wow, that's great. So how did you contribute? What was your role in that? And I find myself quiet in the dream. And then after a while, there's this smile that pops on my face. And I look at my grandkids and I go, well, granddad soundtracked the internet. That was my contribution. I did it with an amazing group of people. And there are, I have some stories to tell you. Let me start with this one. And so I think that we find ourselves in a place where we acknowledge that the internet is probably going to be our generation's legacy. Um, and we really want to contribute to it. And we think that the most beautiful way we can do that is by helping to soundtrack the internet, by adding feelings to the internet. So that's the visionary approach. There's always a problematic approach as well, because we were fueled back in the day we started over 10 years ago, very much by two frustrations as well, because we're five co-founders. And so on the one hand, we said, how can we create a music industry which is optimized for the actual artist and musicians, as opposed for the middlemen? Because currently there was a system which was very much geared towards labels, publishers, PROs, neighboring rights, anyone who was along for the journey had a seat at the table but typically it wasn't optimized for the artists. So fundamentally, I think the terms we used was, how can we create a music industry where artists make shitloads of money? So that was the one problem we wanted to hack. The second one was from a creator, from a storyteller perspective. So my co-founders and I, we have backgrounds in both music production, but also in storytelling. So we made TV shows, films, movies. And we knew firsthand that music was super central in bringing stories to life. So content without music is a bit like food without taste. It might be nourishing, but it's not memorable. It doesn't make an impact. It's not something you talk about. So music was super central. But unfortunately, adding music to content was the worst part of the creative process. It was supposed to be the pinnacle, right? Where you add feelings and you make a scene interesting, scary, um, timid. This is Italy. It isn't. Music adds a feeling. But it was the exact opposite. You were squeezed to find the right relevant music, f clearing it, finding it, paying it, reporting it. And you were terrified um, that if your content was successful and it spread, you knew basically you had a music issue. And so there were two problems from a creator. How can we bring back the joy to storytellers to use music to bring their stories to life? And how can we help redefine the music industry so that we actually help musicians as opposed to the middlemen? So those were the problems, and that was the, the ambition. And has that changed during the journey? 
Um, let's start with the vision part of things. The vision has definitely changed. Um, it's changed in the sense that it's evolved. And I think I'm one of a few fortunate people who get to say it's evolved because we found ourselves over the years accelerating and doing better and better. We found ourselves in a position where we actually were starting to soundtrack the internet in a substantial way. So our music was getting picked up and played billions and billions of times every single month. Um, music is a fantastic medium, so we saw that music spread. So it spread from the internet into regular television, into the business world. It then started spreading into um, the physical world. So in Swedish, what we call offentliga rummet. So we started soundtracking hotels, restaurants, car parks and such. And then it spread into people's private lives, li listening habits. So we evolved from soundtracking the internet to soundtracking the world. So I'd say that that's probably the biggest shift that we've been taken by surprise, the power of music and how that's able, able to spread across multiple media. Yeah, can you walk us through the, the business model? How do, you, how do you find all this music and how is it distributed? Absolutely. So here's what we did. Um, we said that fundamentally we want to try and solve for two things for musicians because if you're a creator at heart you're looking for two main drivers so on the one hand if I've created something I want as many people as possible to hear what I have to say I want it to spread and on the other hand we wanted to find a system so that we could make sure that musicians could sustain themselves and make a living off their talent and off their craft And in order to do that, what we eventually landed in is that we said, here's what we should do. We want to reach out directly to musicians and we'd like to commission tracks from them. Tracks which we believe could be incredibly useful if we're looking to soundtrack the internet. So together with their creative powers, together with our insights over time as we accumulated more and more customers, we thought that we, this is the perfect setup platform um, to help creators be creative. So we started acquiring uh, tracks And we collectively, we built a catalog of music. So over time, accumulated tens of thousands of tracks across hundreds and hundreds of genres. Then we started reaching out to companies and saying that, listen, we've built this incredible uh, treasure of music, which is um, yours to use to soundtrack your content. And we started to serve it as a subscription. So companies would pay us a fixed monthly fee and they get to use the tracks to bring their content to life. We started with traditional medias and television, production companies, ads. Then we added the online world. So the MCNs, the YouTubers, the Twitchers, the Instagrams, the Facebooks, the Yoku, the Rokus. Then the company started coming along because they wanted to share their business content. And then we just grew and grew and grew. So on the one hand, we have all these hundreds of thousands of customers who pay us a fixed monthly fee, which is a subscription, and they get access to our music. When we then evolved our business model was when we saw that the music was so powerful it started to spread. So people wanted to listen to it standalone on the music streaming platforms. I heard this great piece of music, they started to shazam it. And after time we decided to put our music on the likes of Apple, Deezer, Spotify, because we saw that there was so much demand built up from our distribution model. And so when we put the mu music on these platforms, they generated royalty. And then we said, well, The fundamental problem we want to try and solve is give distribution but also monetization so besides having paid for the track up front we said let's split all the royalties that we generate 50 50 with all the musicians out there and so that's how basically how our business model works so it's a subscription business on the one hand and on the other hand we accumulate music and we then share royalties that the music generates sort of off the distribution we get so if the musician provides you with a track uh, that gets um you know, played in uh, some business presentations, etc. They get <clears throat> the musician gets paid once for uh, submitting a track, and then if it gets viral and spreads across the streaming platforms, they get royalty as well. They get paid infinitely, correct. Okay. And so the concept here was: how can we build a model where, in both scenario, a creator wins? So if the track never gets used, which is the case of many tracks around the world. We wanted to make sure we didn't have an old school model where people would typically say, I'm not going to pay you up front. There might be royalty. Hence, the creator was taking a big, big risk. We said that that's unacceptable. So we looked at the typical lifetime value of a track. We deducted a number and then we added to that number. and We said, we're going to pay you this up front. So we don't want you to take the financial risk. 
It may get used in business presentations, it may not. But we deem that this is a great piece of content that we would very much like to have in our catalog. Then our distribution um, engine, which is all of our customers, as that track starts to travel, a lot of our tracks get traction, they get wings, they get picked up in all different kinds of contexts. And if then that starts to generate listens on platforms where it's only the music standalone, that then generates royalty and that we share 50-50. But I, I happen to know that the, the copyright organizations are a bit annoyed with, with the, uh, these kinds of business models. Why is that? Is that because they think that you don't share the, the, the royalties? So I think that there are multiple answers to the question. Um, I'm not sure that they're annoyed anymore, but um, here's how I would frame it. I would say that 10 years ago when we started, we had an approach to business which was very Swedish in the sense that let's be incredibly humble, let's not give tons of interviews and tell people exactly what we're doing, because we're embarking on a very long and an ambitious journey where we want to soundtrack the internet. We weren't super keen to let the rest of the world know precisely what we were doing, because that would invite competition, it would make life more difficult for us. So we dug down our heels, we got to work, and we had a very, like I said, Swedish approach, no interviews. Um, as we started to gain more and more traction, people became more and more curious, and we doubled down and said, we're going to keep on doing our thing. We don't want to share exactly what we're doing. I think that that caused um, a lot of interest, a lot of intrigue, um, and to some extent, some frustration because people couldn't understand exactly what we were doing. That changed a few years ago, and so we became much more vocal, and we said, listen, this is the journey we're on. This is what we're trying to do. Mm. I would argue from that state, in time, the rest of the music community was much more accommodating, much more understanding, because then suddenly they had something to go on. They had an understanding. We didn't allow for too much interactions because we wanted to really try and do something different and not be too influenced of legacy. We wanted to go in a totally different direction. Having said all that, I mean, of course there is some friction because I think ultimately what we're all trying to do is we're trying to create a world where intellectual property where content is super strong and very very powerful it's just that we're going at it from two different perspectives i would argue that our way is more decentralized where we're making a model that doesn't hinge on certain specific institutions uh, instead we've built those capabilities ourselves we feel that the way that data has evolved nowadays, we can use services which are readily available for everyone when it came, comes to aggregating data or building storage or tracking or paying or understanding or gathering insights. We have that skill set. So we don't deem that we need to go through the old institutions. And I think there's something provocative in that when you realize that the system that was previously the only way to do stuff now has competition, there's, that there's an alternative. I ultimately think that that makes the industry way stronger because it gives choice, marketplace, competition. Everyone is better off for it. But I acknowledge that if 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 you're part of the older institution, it's somewhat scary. Yeah. No, I think I mean for for a musician or creator, it's uh, it's not either or. It's it's both probably. You maybe release an album uh, on on the streaming platforms and with a record label, and you get royalties from there. And you can also sell music to to Epidemic uh, for different purposes. Yeah, I mean, you you touch upon one of the most important parts of our business model, which is we were very set up on building something which is complementary to how the industry works today. We don't believe in a one-size-fits-all system. Uh, it doesn't work with clothes. It doesn't work with food. There needs to be variety in order to make things interesting. And so our model is very much built around we think it should be optional. There should be different ways of supporting yourselves. Either you can do it through the old system, through ours. You should be able to, to do exactly what's up to every individual creator. And how, how big is the company now? What's the evaluation? Um, valuation is always difficult because that's basically in the eye of the beholder. Um, I can speak to the actual numbers. So we're more than 400 employees. We've been around for 10 years. Uh, we have offices in 10 different countries. Um, our customers are in the hundreds of thousands. Um, we're growing at a healthy pace, double digit, and have been for the last decade. We are doing a very good job of soundtracking the internet. Our music is played basically... 1.5 billion times per day. I think that's how I'd characterize where we are. We have 
thousands of musicians who we work with. We call them creators um, because some of them are songwriters, some of them are beats makers, some of them are singers, some of them are all of the above, some of them are musicians. We're a much wider church now than we were back in the day when we started a decade ago because we've been able to evolve and provide more insights, more data, more work for more people. Because it used to be mainly instrumental music, right? Like yes. background music. Yes, yeah, so there's an interesting anecdote around that. Um, people often characterize uh, history by rewriting it to their favor. I'm going to stay true to how it actually played out. Um, so a number of years ago, we were in a situation where um, we had a food company reach out to us. And they said that, look, we've come to realize that people chew um, in accordance with the BPM. Fast music during lunch is not such a bad idea because then sort of more people can sit and eat. Um, hence the better utilization of the restaurant. And when it rains, it would be quite practical to play um, slower music because they buy an additional coffee or extra food. Hence, we're very much looking for functional music that can help set the tone. Nudging in a way. Um, I mean, yeah, I, that's definitely one way of putting it. I think another way of putting it is trying to accommodate for uh, reducing the tempo in the morning, increasing it during certain hectic hours to sort of make some f the flows work. Um, I think there are a number of reasons why that's interesting. And they go, well, we hear great things about what you've uh, done with your company. We'd very much like to try your service. And so we did. And then after two weeks, they call us up and they say, this is amazing. Um, your music is fantastic. We love it. Customers really appreciate it too. There's just one problem. And that's uh, our employees want to kill themselves. And it's kind of your fault. <laughs> um, and we chuckle both. And I go, okay, that's interesting. So why is that? Well, imagine if you're making uh, food for an entire day and you only hear instrumental music. You feel a bit like Jack Nicholson in One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. Could you think about maybe doing vocal tracks as well? And we go, that's interesting. So historically, we haven't done that because our music is predominantly intended to soundtrack the internet. And typically, there's somebody talking, there's a show, there's an ad, there's some content that we need to accommodate for. But yes, we could definitely do that. And so we start producing vocal music and uh, the reception amongst all our business area is tremendous. People go, this is amazing. Production value increases. This is something that we really are excited about. So that basically sparked us into putting shifting gears and moving our focus much more to commercially releasing music with vocals, with sort of the entire shabam. And this was... I'd say six, seven years ago. So now the majority of what we what we produce is uh, vocal music, um, and that's at the core of what we do. But it was a progression getting there, and it wasn't geniuses sitting in a room saying that this is probably the right thing to do. It was much more listening to our users, to our customers. What do people want? But you you also probably have like um, algorithms and um, uh, data showing exactly what kind of mu kinds of music are more popular, yes. right? So what what do you see there? So that brings us to another thing that we're trying to change. So I would argue that historically, the role of A&R, so finding music and making it more or less popular, has not been a democratic process. It's been a few people who have been allowed to say that I, I deem this to be good. Let's put it out there until people start downloading it, buying it or consuming it at scale. One of the things that we try to do is could we find a way to democratize a &R? Could we find a way to make it less dependent on a couple of people in a room? Instead, we let the world decide what's good or not. So what we did is, as we started to scale, we realized that, look, we have hundreds of thousands of customers and the music that we put out gets consumed billions of times per month. We obviously control that data and we get access to the aggregate of what is working. So we could see across the world that people looking for lo-fi beats, tropical house isn't a thing, um, small emotions is a thing. Um, okay, so now um, ska or trap or something is, is, is starting to grow. People are searching more for it. It's getting more likes. It's getting more uh, comments on different platforms. Because we're everywhere, we could basically see in real time that this is what the world seems to appreciate. And we could take that information and we started funneling it back to musicians. So we tried to use the fact that A&R is now democratized. It's billions of people saying what they like as opposed to a few saying what's good. We then take that information and we share that with the musicians. So the, uh, 
the the old picture of, of how a musician would work would be somebody sitting all alone in the room, cutting their ear off, tragic. I have inspiration, I write something, in this case Van Gogh write, but sort of in a music setting as well. And this is what I created standalone. So is there interest for this? And while there's merit to that, um, we felt that why not help and educate our creators and say that, look, we're seeing all this data that this kind of music, these kind of vocals, these kind of texts are interesting. This is something which is sought after. And by presenting them to musicians, say, is this something that, is, that inspires you? And more often than not, um, our creators would go, that gives me an idea. And they start writing something. So creating this back and forth where we have big data, which gives insights, helps A&R, helps to sort of give people ideas, but also obviously managing that balance because you don't want something that just reinforces more and more of the same, but offering that kind of knowledge saying that if you want to access this, this is an opportunity, but we're just as happy letting people come up with their own ideas. Yeah. So it's not like, uh, yeah, your cello playing is really nice, but now we need score. <laughs> They're like, oh, okay. <laughs> no, um, definitely not. Um, but I will say this, though. There are two interesting things that happen at scale because when you get to work with thousands of creators, um, we can cover very many different genres so we can accumulate a lot of um, interesting data and we can share that with people. The second thing we can start to do is um, we can start to suggest that people work together. So we can take somebody who does a lot of ska together with somebody who does metal, and we think you should try something out. We can take a yodeler together with somebody who does trap and say, we think this might be a cool, uh, something cool. And super interesting things pop up. Sometimes it's whack and super strange, which is beautiful. Um, and sometimes it's amazing. What you're saying about disrupting the music industry kind of reminds me of uh, the other Swedish company called Amuse, <clears throat> where I, I tried it as well because I'm a hobby musician. And um, if you have re um, tracks and you want to release them, it's very difficult. It's usually the distribution that's the problem. With Amuse, you can just upload your tracks onto the service with uh, an artwork, and then after two weeks, it's released on all streaming platforms. And if they, if they and their algorithms find it to be interesting and it goes viral then they will invest as a record label and uh, uh, fund your marketing uh, yeah. to gain further boost it's also an interesting approach I think I think it's super interesting and I think that we are kindred spirits in that we very much believe the intersection between individuals and people and human creativity <clears throat> meeting um, algorithms uh, scalable tech platforms and huge audiences I think that finding new and exciting ways to um, forge them together is definitely sort of a sign of the times. And is, uh, is Sweden and Stockholm particularly good at this, you think? Or are we seeing in, um, a developing sort of uh, music tech industry here? Uh, without a doubt, right? Um, I think that we've been... Historically, I used to talk about three different waves. So the first wave coming out of Sweden was obviously the artists. You had the Robins, the Abbas, the front lines of big acts who put Sweden on the map and have done for decades. I would then argue that the second wave was taking one step back from the front line to the mid line. So you had the producers. So you had the Serafiona, you had the Avicis, you had the Swedish House Mafia, people who were producers and musicians and somewhere in between. Obviously, very influential. Again, helped put Sweden on the map and created this cluster around music. And then came the third wave of music creativity, which is an additional step into um, the actual scalable part of the business, which was when tech and music uh, hooked up. So, uh, I mean, Spotify, SoundCloud, X5, Amuse, um, ourselves. I'm sure I'm missing a couple of companies there, but there have been a lot of companies who very much... Um, done very well and I think that they're all tied together because there's a there's a sense of uh, pride in music in general so it's quite um, logical for Swedes to think that music is is a route which as a profession makes a ton of sense um, from a cultural perspective I think that there are there are individuals totems landmarks who people aspire to be like um you want to be like an artist or a producer or someone like daniel or martin or something like that i think that's very important because it sends um uh, sets a precedent and it creates uh, a desire and an ambition 
I think in the wake of all these companies, there is capital and there's interest, but maybe more important, there's skill. So even though it's tough to recruit people in general, um, I think that the talent pool in, in Stockholm uh, and Sweden, for that matter, is outstanding when it comes to finding these kinds of individuals. When we then venture outside of Sweden and um, I find myself in the US or in Seoul or in Sydney or wherever it might be, and the moment I open my mouth with my semi-Swedish dialect and say, hey, I'm Oscar, I'm from Sweden and we do music, everyone without exception goes, that makes sense. This is interesting. What do you have to say? Um, so we can use that global conception of music and innovation having a healthy standing in Sweden internationally. So that gives us the benefit of the doubt. And sometimes if you're a somewhat good salesperson, that's all you need. So you need the, the concept of the glass being half full rather than half empty in that first meeting to get the ball rolling. And how can we nurture uh, this um, entrepreneurship uh, when it comes to music and tech in, in Stockholm and the startup scene in general? What, what is uh, needed for it to, to thrive even more? I mean, talent is a, a problem because because we need more people. <laughs> Um, housing is a, a huge issue here. Yeah. What, what, what do you see more? So um, I think I'm going to steer away from, from the typical political questions. You mentioned a few of them. So housing, um, so moving here, visa, those kind of things. Um, rather, I think that what's super important and something that I try to be mindful of is that is the whole concept of paying it forward by being generous with the knowledge and the time that so obviously helped us out in our early days um, by making sure that we apply that sort of to the wider community. So I think a sense of being open about um, failures, successes, uh, participating in uh, some meetups, uh, inviting other companies in, um, generally trying to pay it forward, I think is one of those things which is a great thing. So I'll give you a couple of examples. Um, we have, uh, on a bi-weekly basis, we always have external people coming to us. They're typically startups, scale-up, interesting people who are passionate about something. And we like to sort of come and sort of learn from them, listen to them, potentially give them a platform through us because we have a network which is very huge uh, within the music tech space. We do vice versa. We go and give presentations at different schools, institutions, companies, um, but make sure that we really pay our dues in terms of helping to educate um, the, the wider ecosystem. I think in terms of making sure that we work with representation, um, supporting the right kind of events, making sure that we take a responsibility as a company in terms of um, it can be everything from CO2 emissions, uh, offsetting that and being vocal about it, how we hire, how we um, actively work with diversity, trying to lead by example. I think is important and it's tough right because when you're working especially now we don't see ourselves as a startup anymore we see ourselves as a scale-up and I, I like to think the way I define the difference is that while you're a startup you're constantly questioning your business model like oh, holy shit was this a good idea so does this work is this smart whereas where you're scale-up you're past that point and you understand that the business model works. Instead, you're constantly second-guessing yourself. Holy shit, am I smart enough? Am I good enough? Is she good enough? Is he good enough? Do we have the right people in the right place? So we're very much in, in, in the latter. So we're scaling up. And I think that the pace is, let's say, very high. And so making sure that you step back, smell the coffee, don't lose track of the bigger picture as you're trying to hit your next target, your next milestone, your next goal try and see things in the bigger context of things. I think that's always a challenge. You, you mentioned uh, in the introduction uh, a vision about the future. And um, I listened to your participation in uh, Fuck Up Podden, which is called uh, Fuck Up Pod in, in Swedish, uh, with Johanna and uh, Caroline, whom I also have interviewed here. And you mentioned something about uh, setting five-year goals. Mm. Is that still relevant for you or is the pace much faster now? How do you sort of map the future from your personal perspective and business-wise? Um, It's a really easy question. <laughs> <laughs> Let's have a crack at it. Um, I've always been a firm believer of setting up goals 
and then breaking them down into smaller goals. I think it's wise for a couple of different reasons. One, I'm a huge fan of you as an individual having to own your endorphins. So you need to set yourself up for success. And what I mean by that is if, if you have a big audacious target, um, so uh, case in point, I had salmonella many years ago and I got something called arthritis as a, as a consequence and my, my, my joints just broke down. And I wanted to overcome it, so I set myself the target of doing Vasa Loppet. And Vasa Loppet is a 90-kilometer ski race, which is grueling, which is the worst thing probably if you have arthritis. And that goal in itself was unattainable, but but breaking that down into I'm going to do a walk, and then I'm going to do a three-kilometer run, and then I'm going to do this, and then I'm going to do this, breaking it down into small installments that I could somewhat easily achieve and feeling good about myself and learning to sort of really appreciate those dopamines and over time accelerate that feeling. That was something that really worked out well for me on a personal level. And so I think that business-wise here at Epidemic, we've always done that. So back to Fakapodan, yes, we absolutely have always, we still do set ourselves five targets. And then we would break those down into installments of, let's say over the next one to two years, in order to hit that point, this is what needs to happen. The only thing that changes when you accelerate faster is you still have a five-year plan, but rather than setting yourself only a one- or two-year goal, that breaks down into quarterly targets and quarterly goals. So you're a little bit more granular because the speed is faster. And so the necessity of doing that is when you run as fast as companies in our position do, you need to be very aware of when you're getting it right, when you're getting it wrong. You can't afford to get it wrong for a year and then go, hmm, that was sort of a kind of a shit idea. So you need to have a much shorter cadence. And the flip side uh, of the necessity and the benefit of it is that by setting these targets up and if you're doing it right and you're constantly trying to improve, you make sure that you get these endorphin hits a lot because running fast can be quite, um, quite tiring. And so by making sure that you have systems of let's say OKRs or something similar, where you have objectives, key results, you break them down per department, per person, per month, per quarter, or whatever it might be, and then hitting those targets. I believe much more in carrot than stick. And I think the reason why those are good isn't because it gives so much more control, but it gives people a sense of completion. And when you get that, you feel good about yourself and you're excited about the next step. So by building an energy... Um, I think that's something that's super duper helpful. And celebrate often. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, so th that's actually one of our core values. We, 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 we take it seriously in terms of celebrating often. Um, so yeah, I'm a f strong believer. It's like uh, when you look at the roadmap to um, reaching the climate goals mm -hmm. and, and they say that everyone needs to cut the emissions in half by 2030. It sounds uh, really difficult, almost unattainable. But when you break it down, it's like you need to reduce 7% each year. Mm -hmm. It's nothing. Yeah. Like 7%. Anyone can do that. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, I, I totally agree. And I think it's, it's a great example. And I think that one, one anecdote on that theme is that I remember uh, many years ago, um, I, um, I had tons of friends who were vegetarians, and I wasn't. And... At some point in time, I, I was struck. This is not an empiric study, but I was struck by all my friends who are vegetarian. I tend to think that they're smarter than the norm. I tend to think that they know something that I don't. Um, so that was one data point. I'm like, hmm, they're probably onto something. Um, and then at that point, I think I saw a TED talk. I think it was Al Gore talking about um, a planet in crisis and we need to change uh, our perception. And the whole concept, which you just alluded to, about reducing your carbon footprint with 50%, that's a great environmental sort of approach, and we need to get there sooner rather than later. Um, and it got me thinking about the whole concept, because in, in Sweden, historically, my opinion was that people who were vegetarian were seen as difficult. Uh, it was something that you had to accommodate around. It was impractical if you had the kids and you were bigger, um, bigger groups. Um, and you would almost use the term flexitarian uh, as a way to shame someone. So you're not a real vegetarian because you're only a flexitarian. You're only a vegetarian when it suits you. Um, and the cultural conception around that was very negative. What I found very much during the last couple of years is that it's interesting because for me and for society at large, I think that shifted. Because I, I started thinking along the lines that you did in terms of, okay, so I want to go vegetarian for climate reasons. 
um, and I want to go. I want to get to fifty percent. How can I address that? And I started looking at sort of the way I consume food, and it turns out not very original. It's breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And I go, okay. So step one: How about if I make my breakfast a hundred percent vegetarian? Because I would have sandwiches and there'd be uh, meat and different kinds of stuff. And I went, okay, so what about one third of all my meals? I, I go vegetarian. And that was an immediate switch. So porridge, cereal, nuts, berries, boom. I'm vegetarian in the morning. Dinner is much more difficult because we're a family of five and so that's difficult to accommodate. But the next step was looking at lunches. So I could sort of break down the lunches and go, so okay, half of my lunches in a week, I'll just make them vegetarian because I can make that choice. It doesn't affect anyone else. So to your specific point, so culture shifts... I'm no longer shamed for being a flexitarian. I said, no, 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 I, I just make sure that 50% of what I eat, I, I make it vegetarian with an exact purpose. So I, I completely subscribe to your view of, sort of small incremental steps getting there in all facets of life. Yeah, and I also think that's, uh, that's kind of a tech approach uh, that you can apply to uh, your personal development because you also you always iterate and sort of <laughs> emerge uh, towards the goal um, rather than saying something really um, really difficult and then failing. Yeah. It seems like if you work in this kind of um, ecosystem and environment and uh, with this kind of scale-up business, you need to be future optimistic in a way? Yes, I think so. Um, I think there are a couple of ingredients that help. One is <laughs> you need to be comfortable carrying risk. Right? A second one is... Yes, I think you need to be an optimist. I think there's an interesting discussion to be had around being an optimist because sometimes I would argue that it's it's a trait that you're born with. You're either an optimist, a realist, or a pessimist. Some people believe that it's something that's predetermined and you can't really affect it. I'm not so sure about that. I think that very much people can see that a glass has water which goes to the middle And every single day you have a choice. You can choose to say, well, the glass is obviously half empty. Or you can choose to say, no, it's obviously half full. What I find interesting over time, um, and it can be tough because it's it's tiresome always carrying the optimistic approach. But by saying the glass is half full to a lot of people, I think that inspires people. It gives them energy. It gives them hope. It gives them um, something Um, it helps them along in their journey. So I think that to some extent, being an optimist is a little bit of a job. It's something that you should um, take seriously. You should have strategies. You should have structure. It's far from wise to always be an optimist. You definitely need a yin and yang in both to create some kind of dan- dynamic. You can't always say that everything is focus. Um, so I think you very much need to work with those two powers, if you will. But I, yes, I would argue that being an optimist is some is the crucial ingredient of getting stuff off the ground, getting things to scale. Um, I remember when we started, people said that what you're looking to do is impossible. You might as well give up. There's a huge trigger in something like that. If, if people say that things can't be done, um, that's something that I think some people get energy from. Some people get beaten down. Um, but it's definitely something that you shouldn't take for granted. It's something you need to look after and nurture because it can be very powerful and ultimately help you. What is your best tip for making the world a better place in the future? I'd definitely tie that back into um, breaking things down in, into smaller parts. I think that having big goals, big ambitions is great, but I think that tactics beat strategy any day of the week. So um, I'll give you a concrete example. So uh, summertime when uh, my family and I go to the beach, uh, my wife and I with, with with our kids, we have this rule where we say that everyone always has to pick up five pieces of garbage each when we're at the beach. Um, because ultimately I think that we're sincere when we say we'd like to leave the world a better place than we found it. And rather than having all these huge goals, which are difficult to get around to because life tends to happen, you should really try and break things down into tiny goals. So if it's making a portion of your food uh, vegetarian, if it's about picking up five pieces of garbage, bring stuff into your vada, into your everyday life that's easy to attain. And then you can hit your 7% much easier than you think. And then you you don't factor that into your life anymore as something that you have, you, you have to... Um, 
uh, struggle to achieve, it becomes routine, and then you can add an additional seven and an additional seven. So breaking things into s- small goals. Great. Uh, do you have a reading tip or a podcast tip? Reading tip. I think because I'm an optimistic guy and I live my life in that world, when I read, I tend to go really dark instead. Uh, I think there's something in that yin and yang. So I read all the Kepler books, which I think are amazing. I just read, uh, I think his name is Niklas Dag or Nat, uh, 1794. Not a dog. Sorry, not a dog. Thank you. Um, a book about Stockholm in the 1700s, which is really dark, and I found it uh, fantastic. So I read the first one and the second one. Um, so those would be my two tips. Great. Who do you think I should interview? Um, I think you should talk to um, Elsa Bernadotte, maybe at Karma. Um, I think what Karma is doing is super duper cool and tying into the future. I think they're a company which is actively trying to build the future that I would like to live in. So I think you should talk to her. They help uh, restaurants uh, use the food waste and uh, distribute it to people who want it, right? Yeah, she can do a better job to talk about what they're looking to do, but absolutely, they're looking to reduce food waste. They're looking to create a generation of people where there's zero food waste. And I think ultimately move a step ahead of that to make sure that we use food and resources in a much more efficient way. Thank you so much, Oscar, Oscar for joining here, Frampton, and thank you for inviting me to Epidemic. Thank you so much for letting me join. Uh, my name is Kishan van Essen, uh, hereframpton.se. Uh, you can find everything you need to know. And uh, epidemicsound.com is the platform where you can learn more about uh, Epidemic and their journey. Um, listen next week. We'll talk about something else. Bye.